All right, good evening. My name is Dirk Alborn. I'm the CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies, and uh, well, we're transforming transportation at the speed of sound. So who here actually knows um, what the Hyperloop really is? I'll test you guys later. So for everybody else, we have a little video here that shows how it all started, where we are today, where we're going. So enjoy. America's always been a nation of doers. We build things, we take risks, and we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Billionaire philanthropist Elon Musk has hinted at a new high-speed transport system that could put planes and trains out of business. I have a name for it, name for it which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan, move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel. It's something like that, yeah. Here's how he teased the idea in May at an All Things D conference. It's a cross between a Concorde and a railgun. It's called the Hyperloop. It's a system of giant suspended tubes. Riding within are capsules carrying people or freight traveling on cushions of air at speeds of up to 1,200 k's per hour, or roughly one kilometer every three seconds. A tube that would be on pillars from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and inside there would be capsule cars that would be rocketed forward up to 700 miles an hour, and that there would be a fan on the front. Elon Musk basically says that this is the way of the future. How would you like something that uh, can never crash? Mm -hmm. um, it is immune to weather. It goes uh, three or four times faster than the, the, the sort of bullet train, and it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket. It will only cost to build this six or seven billion dollars. Oh. Compare that to the 65 billion for the current high speed rail plans for California. He believes this is a viable, valuable alternative for mass transit between these two destinations. Could something like the Hyperloop actually be the answer to super fast, environmentally friendly, high speed travel between our busiest cities? So the gauntlet has been thrown down. A design document for a whole new super cool way to travel. The only thing now, will someone pick it up and make the Hyperloop a reality? There are some companies that are, that are forming to try to make the Hyperloop happen and uh, I, encourage them. I think that's, that's great. Um, I'm super focused on Tesla and SpaceX and to, to, to you know, a small amount on Solar City. so that, that basically completely uses up my, my brain. Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The only resistance would be the air in front of the capsule which uh, we move to the back by using a compressor. The company Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. Dirk Alborn says it's safer and more efficient than the railroad. Well the system is complete, completely computerized so um, you, know, you optimize the system and then you actually have the humans to monitor it. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system, we're completely managed by a computer system. There's no human factor that can actually create those issues. We actually plan on uh, seeing the first Hyperloop very, very soon starting. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane, actually. Obviously, for us, it's very important to make it as good of an experience as possible. So This is an independent organization that has formed. We have 170 engineers, scientists, and uh, really great professionals with amazing backgrounds. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods, known as the Hyperloop, is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5, with construction set to begin in 2016. Let's bring in Dirk Alburn, who is the man who runs the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies team, which is announcing this deal with Quay Valley, California. Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. 
that's um, when we will be start um, working on our development. So we will be starting ground uh, at the same time. Uh, we at this moment we expect to be done by 2018. Hyperloop now appears one step closer to reality. Starting next year, that theory will turn into a groundbreaking in Quay Valley, Kings County off of I-5. A developer there has just committed a big chunk of his private land toward the project. It's a five mile loop that would take visitors through a planned entertainment district. There's gonna be a test track. Elon Musk has announced that he's gonna build a small scale test track. It's a necessary step for us to be building a full scale version and um, Quay Valley is a sustainable model town of the 21th century. So it's a perfect fit. They're expecting over 10 million uh, visitors per year. So we will actually be able to re uh, generate revenues very, very fast. The company plans to go public later this year. We want to do a public offering. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. We want to make sure that um, the people that have been helping building um, the company and this technology are able to um, participate in, in, in the investment in the fundraising and the upside of the company. With their contributions to Hyperloop, these students from around the world now have stock options in the company, but they say they're not in it for the money. As a student, I start to feel like um, I'm in, uh, in part of a, some great career that might change the world. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The so Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies. And it's the right time. It's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. Do so you think this is possible? This is not just... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. For all those who said this is just a neat little thing to draw on a cocktail napkin, these guys are saying it will become reality. All right. So those were two and a half years put together in five, six minutes. A couple of things are missing, but I'll talk about them right now. So just to reiterate, what is a Hyperloop? Imagine a capsule filled with people, or freight, hovering inside a tube and going really, really fast from point A to point B. The capsule hovers through a, pass a passive magnetic levitation system, which um, was developed actually by Lawrence Livermore National Labs, which is one of the national research labs in America. You see. When we came out and started to work on this technology, most people said, this is not possible. Turns out that actually all the technology to do this is already here today, in 2016. It's doable. You just have to find great people that have them somewhere stored away, like ESA probably has plenty of those, right? We're working on safety first. So you know, when we choose on um, what to do with a Hyperloop, we decided to go first with passengers. Freight is much simpler, but freight doesn't complain, right? Freight doesn't die. So you have to start with what's the most difficult part. How do you make sure that those passengers are safe? And um, the levitation system, because it's passive, is actually one of the examples. It doesn't need any power to levitate. It levitates through the motion. Um, who's interested in the magnetics, we can have a chat later, but basically, if there's no electricity, it still levitates until it reaches a lower speed and then it touches gently to make sure you're all safe. But also when we talk about materials, we do a lot of research on materials, construction methods. We're looking into building the capsule with uh, a sandwich system where you have an outer and an inner skin. So that makes sure that you're always safe. If one of the skins is damaged, there's still the other one that makes sure that you get back to the station, right? Because the only thing is that you're inside a low pressure environment. The system in itself is 10 times safer than an airplane. So as I said earlier, you basically take this tube and you have compressors along the way. These compressors take air out, right? So you're in a low pressure environment, and now the capsule, very similar to an airplane that goes into high altitudes, can travel much, much faster with much less energy. 
because it doesn't have any resistance. It doesn't touch anywhere, there's no air. It's on pylons, which uh, has the advantage, well, that we have to buy less land. It's important for the construction cost. We can integrate the latest technologies for earthquakes. And, um, well, one really important part is that you can actually get from one side to the other, right? Because normally when they build a freeway, when they build a train, they don't really care how you get from one side to the other. If you own the land, they tell you, well, you figure it out, or maybe switch with your neighbor. Problem is, neighbors don't always get along. Capacity is something that comes up quite often. So with one tube, we can substitute air travel five times between Los Angeles and San Francisco. So we have two. But in case that that wouldn't be enough, we're actually over-engineering the pylon so that we're able to add on more tubes. And now this is a very early concept, but it just shows how we would be able to add on different lines. This is the most important part. The system is completely green. So we use solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and in some climates, even geothermal, to produce more energy than we're using. Now, this is the most important part, not because it's green and we all want to be nice to the environment, but actually, it has a big benefit for us because we're producing more energy than we're using. So now our operational costs are very, very low. You see, there's a big problem in public transportation. They don't make money. There's no rail line, there's no metro that makes money. They're all depending on government subsidies, billions of dollars. We, with a $30 ticket price between Los Angeles and San Francisco, would be profitable within eight years. But why should we do this? This is why. Traffic. Now, I've been around in Munich a little bit, and very similar. So we spend a lot of time in traffic, a lot of time we could be productive, a lot of time that we're away from the people that we love, right? Actually, traffic is so important for us that based on where we live, we decide where to work. Based on where we live, we decide who to date. Because if she lives on the other side of the city, it probably will not work out. And then there's this. Traveling sucks. I don't know anybody who really enjoys the experience of going and taking a flight. And you know those safety things where you have to raise your arms? They don't work. If you go on the internet and YouTube and you Google a little bit, you will see that actually there's ways on how to get anything in there. They're mostly there to make you feel safe. So you're getting treated like animals to feel safer. Right? But we can do better today. And that's the important part. Then there's this. Beijing on a sunny day. <laughs> on a bad day, you actually can't see your hand in front of your face. Now you will set, tell me, well, OK, this is China, and it's a problem they have there. They walk around with the masks. But this is actually a problem that we have everywhere. So if you live in a European city, Pollution shortens your life by roughly 14 months. Now think about what you would do with 14 months more you could live. So, of course, traffic is only a small part of it, and BMW is helping with the i3 and the i8, but I think we can do better, and I think we have to. And then there's this, the railway industries a dinosaur industry, literally. They haven't changed forever. The most innovative thing is maglev, which was developed in Germany in the 1930s. The first prototype was done in the 70s. Remember the famous Transrapid? And that's it. So in the last over 50 years, nothing has happened. We're building old, expensive infrastructure, when we could build new infrastructure that's much cheaper to build. These are tracks, railroad tracks, the way they're being built today. 
The distance between those tracks is a meter 43.5. Anybody here knows why? Oh, well, yeah, it's a, basically it's a Roman carriage, right? So basically, we're building new infrastructure today, 2016, based on the butts of two horses. <laughs> so, but now if we would take those and actually make them a little bit larger, we would be able to transport more people, transport them faster, right? And more importantly, safer. And actually, France and Spain, at least for the high-speed trains, have done so. And then there's this, as I mentioned earlier. They're not making money. There's no metro, no rail. They're all losing. The LA metro, as an example, 76 cents per passenger is what they make. And $2.50 are coming from taxpayers. Now, you'll tell me, well, that's LA, and LA is a car town, and who, who takes the metro in LA? Oh, that's right. But actually, it's a problem we have everywhere. Even in New York, you remember New York's famous subway? They're losing $2.2 billion every single year, 82 cents per passenger. Germany, it's actually really, really hard to figure out how much uh, money the German rails get. I come, came to the conclusion of something about $22 billion. Officially, it says something between five and nine, still a lot. So that's the money that we're spending today in every single country, because they're not capable of building better systems that are actually generating income. So, but how would our lives be if there would be a Hyperloop? I think that's an important question. Airports, big issue, overflowing. We are building more and more airports everywhere. So now these airports actually could become terminals. You could connect them with a high-speed line and um, just drive between them, they could be further out, right? Because we're faster there. Freight, shipping. Let's think about on-demand economy. Being able, Amazon style, to deliver anything everywhere within an hour in Germany. That's really a problem that's coming for logistic experts. Or getting things from China over land much cheaper within hours not within weeks, big issue. There's a Silk Road project. But this is probably the part that, at least for me, is the most exciting one. We'll be able to live anywhere. You can live in one city, work in the other, right? You can take, well, let's take Munich. I heard earlier, where is she? Over a million and a half for a house somewhere 15 kilometers outside of Munich. So now imagine you could buy very cheap land somewhere else, 150 kilometers away, connected with a Hyperloop, buy the house maybe for 300,000 euros, and be within the city center in 10 minutes. That's the possibility we have. And just with a value increase of the land, we would be actually able to finance the Hyperloop. So it's always the question, what is, your, what is your business model? But how are we planning to do this? Well, we know we can build pylons. We know we can build tubes. We have been for quite some time. We also know that we can create a vacuum inside those tubes. This is a picture of the CERN Hadron Collider in Switzerland. And actually, the tubes are as big as the ones that we're building. And the vacuum is much, much higher. So it's much more difficult to obtain. And the company that's taking care of making sure that vacuum is always there is actually part of our team. So they have the expertise and all the resources to make sure that that actually happens. And when, they, when we explained them our project, they just laughed. Alternative energy is, I would say, a safe bet. Remember, a big important part, we're actually making money because of the energy production. Well, e energy production is getting cheaper and better every single year, similar to Moore's law in the silicon chip. Every year, we're improving. So today, with the newest technology in California, we're able to cover our complete energy costs just with solar, and we still have wind and kinetic energy. 
And we know that in two, three years, it's only going to look better. But we're doing something else in a completely different way. We're building a company in a completely different way. So I saw there's a couple of younger folks around here, so, but normally I say, I'm sure you all know these companies. They all have something in common. Is there anybody who doesn't know any of these companies? Don't be shy. There you go. Which ones? Which ones do you not know? All of them. Awesome. <laughs> That's because they all have something in common. They're all failures. BlackBerry used to be a great phone. This is like before the iPhone was a cool thing to have, still around. They might still have a chance, but it doesn't really look that great. So for me, they're on the list. Then there are these companies. They all have something in common as well. All of these companies, at one point of the history, incorporated something into their business model that's called crowdsourcing. Some of these companies have more than 50% of the innovation coming from the outside. Lego, probably you all know, was almost bankrupt. They switched the CEO. The new CEO incorporated crowdsourcing into their model, and today it's the most successful toy company out there. So when we talk about trains and metros, normally it's done here, behind closed doors. You hear about they're planning something somewhere, and it's going to cost billions, but that's it. You don't hear anymore until hopefully it's done or not. We do something that we call crowdstorming. So <laughs> we ask our community, we ask you guys for ideas. You can join the team. We ask questions. We question everything. Things like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket the best way to monetize? Because if we can find a way that we make more money, the more the passenger rides, then the ticket becomes negative. Then you use a ticket only to regulate demand. I'm making always the example of video games. For example, when I was a kid, I had to buy my video games. They were super expensive. And um, well, today, most of them are free. But the video game companies are making way more money than ever before because they found a new business model. And I think that's something that, especially here, and when we talk about the car industry, is super important. What's your business model? Is the business model still selling cars? Or is it going to be the service you're giving to the customer? Will it still own one? Will they own a car, or how do I actually generate income? How do I differentiate? The moment I can call any car at any time, why would I call a BMW? Right? And how does BMW make money? I believe that we would we'll be able to call a car for free. And there's plenty of ways on how you monetize on it. And the same thing we think. So you actually spend a lot of time during your commute in transportation. And if you think about Facebook and Google, for example, they're very profitable companies. But you actually more time in your car or in your transportation than you are on Facebook. Right? But yet the only thing that tries to monetize on your commute is a radio. Think about that. So we're working with our community. We are creating an ecosystem. This is a, a digital innovation challenge that we do in Bratislava on the 6th of July where we are doing the digitalization of transportation. You see, we, we, it's not for us, it's not only about moving a capsule inside a tube. We have to create a complete solution. Because if it takes you an hour and a half to get to the station, you're not going to use it every single day. You're going to use it once, a month, like an airplane. So, and we don't know. We don't, we're not the best ones in innovating. We have some ideas. but. We know that the moment we're creating an ecosystem, this ecosystem will continuously innovate. Think about your phone, right? Where is it really the phone, or is it actually the app store that makes you interested in the phone? And this, the app store is continuously making sure that there's new things. And we're basically, if you want, so creating the app store for transportation. Oops, this was too fast, but take a look. I'll explain you later. 
The sound is missing. So you see, passenger experience for us is one of the most important things. And um, well, inside the capsule, you don't have windows. So how do you make sure that people are still feeling well? So we, we're working on building or developing what we call augmented windows. It's a screen technology that uses head tracking to see where you're looking. And based on where you're looking, we're moving the image so that it actually really looks like looking outside of a window. So imagine going, and if you can't imagine the Hyperloop, but imagine a metro in between the stops. Now you could go through Jurassic World or Terminator Land and look outside of the window. For you, it's an experience. But for the transportation company, it's actually a possibility to make money. So we're creating experience content, a completely new business model. But why are we working this way? Why are we using crowdstorming? So everybody talks about the Hyperloop and talks about Elon Musk. Turns out, it's actually much older. It's already Jules Verne's son talked about traveling inside a tube. And already in 1870, there was a first attempt in New York. There was a project, a subway, a pneumatic subway. Was the goal was to connect New York and San Francisco. They didn't really get there, but they built a station and they built a track. In 1904, the first patent was done by Robert Goddard for a train inside a vacuum. And, um, well, I think that was fairly early. He's one of the most well-known rocket scientists in the world, by the way. In the 60s, popular science, the Secretary of Transportation of the US, John Wolpe, said that tube travel will change the way Americans live. And there are two projects that they were financing. Then there was the Jetsons. In the 90s, we had Swiss Metro. So the Swiss actually were working on a similar project. They had tunnels underground, low pressure environment, very similar to us. Large maglev trains going through. Mostly cost issues was very large. And I think vacuum technology was still very expensive at that time, um, but technically completely doable. The Simpsons figured it out as well. And then there was Elon Musk. So you see, all these attempts were done by one company in one place, one country. They were depending on one place. So this is a huge undertaking. It's a huge infrastructure. So we realized we had to do more than just building a company. We had to build a movement. I was part of a nonprofit incubator that was funded by NASA. And we were working on a new way of building companies. You see, we do everything online. You get your groceries online, you get, you, you get your dry cleaning, you buy, well, <laughs> you find your boyfriend, girlfriend online. You, in America, even can get divorced online. But when it comes to building a business, it's you with your friends sitting in a beer garden, right? drinking a beer and talking about these big ideas. And then you decide, hey, let's do this. Let's start this. Six months later, you realize that nobody actually had the same problem you had, or that maybe advertising wasn't the best way of making money. It's the biggest challenge when you're building a business. But how about if you would have 100 people, 100 people that are passionate about the same thing you are, that give you their honest opinion, the ideas, the contacts, help you with tasks, you would build a better business. So we built this platform, 
put it online actually in August of 2013, around the same time that Elon Musk proposed the project. And when he said, hey, I think this is a perfect, uh, perfect thing to do, but I'm too busy with Tesla and SpaceX, I would like someone else to pick it up. We reached out, asked for permission, and put it on the platform, and asked our community, should we be working on this? And not only did they say, yes, you should do this, they said, hey, I want to be part of this. So we incorporated the company, got a small team together, and said, everybody who would like to join us and work in exchange for stock options, please apply. We had more than 200 applications, got a team together of around 100 engineers, and started working on the feasibility study. We had sponsorships from different companies. Actually, plenty of investors came and said, hey, I want to invest. And we said, look, we don't even know if this is doable. And we didn't need it, the money. I mean, it would have been nice to have a little bit of money, more money for me. But at the end, we had all the manpower. We had all the tools. We finished the feasibility study at the end of 2014. We knew it's possible technically, it's, and it makes sense economically, which was the most important thing for us. Now, obviously, after we came out and we said this is doable, now there's others that are trying to do the same thing. And that's great, because that's exactly what we wanted to do. You know, when you build a movement, that's part of it. It means that it doesn't depend only from you. Why I'm telling you this? Well, first of all, if you want to join, I want you to join the right one. But I also think it's very interesting. It's exciting to see a completely new way of thinking, open arms, people joining through passion, building a commercial viable company, but through complete open innovation approach, and then traditional ways. And I can tell you that we are moving at, at, a, at, at a speed that's never seen. This is the easiest company I've ever built. So it's exciting that we can do actually big things without having to raise millions of dollars. That's like for the entrepreneurs that are here, build your community, build your movement, ask, ask for help. So by now we're over actually more than 550 professionals all around the world, plus roughly 40 companies. Some of the largest companies in the world are part of our team working in exchange for stock options. We have Erlikon Leibold, as you saw earlier, the inventor of the vacuum pump. Reflect from Munich, the leading augmented reality, virtual reality company. We have some of the largest uh, marketing companies, development, technology. We work with Microsoft, Facebook, everybody. So these guys are not just a couple of guys in a chat room. These are really some amazing people. Here's some of them. And there's some. I'm an educated economist. I've been working in solar energy for 15 years now. Program management, project management, and predominantly advisory for the Department of Defense. I come out of the music industry, kind of mostly known as a saxophone player with Pink Floyd. I currently teach at the University of Southern California. I wrote a book about augmented reality for marketing and PR. One year at CERN and three months at Spotify. And right now I'm working at Facebook. I work as a localization project manager. I'm an Emmy Award winning producer, editor, director. I'll be interning with Tesla Motors for the Thermal and Aero team next semester. I work as a product manager at Cisco Systems. All of my work is in the commercialization of innovation. I'm a product manager at the Walt Disney Company. I own a firm called Open Plan Consultants in Denver. I currently own and operate my own private legal and business development consulting firm. I am currently employed by Apple. I've got over 40 years in surface transportation. I'm currently a test engineer at SpaceX. I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer for Aveta Global. We are the Hyperloops! We are that <laughs> So it's really amazing what you can do when you have passionate people, right, that are all coming together. So students, universities, like the one we're hearing next after me as soon as I wrap up, sorry, um, that are all inspired and trying to see, have the same goal. We have lawyers. I mean, who gets lawyers to work for stock options, right? 
marketers, PR, engineers, universities, and um, everybody for the same goal. We get five new applications every single day. And when they apply, we ask them, what can you bring? And not only what can you bring in terms of, you know, what can you bring, but we actually also ask, can you put some skin in the game? Do you have some money to bring? We never ask them for the money at the end because money for us is actually less important than the right people and the right knowledge. Money, when you show passion, money follows passion. So money is really not a problem. We have more than 600 institutional investors that are willing and interested in giving us money. 30,000 people in the community. Here are some of those applications. I'm done. Yeah, so as I said, you have amazing people, and they're motivated not by money. So I don't know who are the entrepreneurs here. Or who here has a company? So how would you like if your employees, if you know that your employees come tomorrow, even if you don't have any more money? Right? And that's wh where we are. They're fueled by passion. Plus, they say the best people are already working for BMW. So they can, al they can also work for us on the side. And that's a big advantage. But it's really like when you see, and I'm sure that Mariana will show, show you as well, when people are passionate, they, make, they do amazing things. But all right, enough talk. When are we going to see the Hyperloop? So we filed our building permits beginning of the year in Quay Valley, Kings County, California, which is um, right next to the I-5. It's uh, when you drive from Los Angeles up to San Francisco, you're going to see us on the right hand. We did the mapping and the surveying of the land. We're doing the environmental studies. We're ex expecting to break ground very soon, as soon as the county moves a little bit faster. And why Quay Valley? Well, Quay Valley is a model town of the 21st century. It's actually a new development that's being built there. It's cu using cutting edge technology. It's 100% um, walkable, solar powered. But it also has an entertainment district. So they're actually putting three resorts, a theme park, a shopping component in there. So we're going to be able to move 10 million people. Okay? This is not a test track. We already did our test. This is the first full-scale passenger version of the Hyperloop. Plus, beginning of the year, we signed an agreement with the country of Slovakia. Yes, the one that might lose against Germany. But turns out Slovakia and the Eastern Europe is actually one of the most stable country. It's five million people and a very innovative government. Why is this so important for us? It's not about money. Money in this whole project is not the problem. But regulations, you know, that's the biggest hurdle. Innovation is very fast, regulations are very slow. So having a government to be behind you and push you, that's huge. And I'm European, so I'm very excited to see this happen in Europe, because if you had asked me six months ago, I would have said, yeah, you know, until you see this in America or Europe, it's going to take 20 years, because we are slow. It's more likely Asia, Indonesia, India, Africa, the Emirates, Middle East in general. And that's true, those are the areas. We're talking with 14 countries right now. But I think that in Europe, we have some of the best engineers, the best scientists. And for us, building a project here 
get them inspired, get them to participate. Right? Things don't have to, have, to, have to happen in California, which is like building something on Mars. People think that there's robots running around everywhere anyways. But no, we can do things actually here. And that's exciting. So when we started, there were a lot of naysayers. In Germany, there's still a lot of naysayers, by the way, critics. And um, you know, sometimes people are surprised. I actually, and the Transrapid, as I said earlier, comes up all the time. I actually think the Transrapid was awesome, because it was some, someone who tried and challenged something. So this is the answer to the people that, that said this is impossible. I think that if someone tells you that something can't be done, it only means that they haven't figured it out. It doesn't mean that you can't figure it out. So we expect to be open by 2019, and um, you're all invited. Thank you. <laughs>